Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Good morning, saints. <laughs> Still morning, right? Almost. <laughs> Ooh. As we come to the end of our third convention together, the end of the 182nd convention of our diocese, there are so, so many things I want to say to you. We've done a lot of elections, though, so don't worry. I'm not going to say them all. <laughs> But beloved, I, I just have to tell you, I have to start with this, that you, as I look out, are so, so beautiful to me. So beautiful. Day by day, week by week, I see how much you love Jesus, how much you love one another, and how much you love, how much you love the church and how much you are leaning into the mission to be beacons of Christ for the transformation of the world. I see you being brave, half a shade, a full shade braver to love all people as we chip away at dismantling racist structures. I know, believe me, I know these are anxious times and I know it is easy to fear the future. But we have so, so much to celebrate and rejoice in that I can't help but believe that our best days are ahead of us, and God is walking step by step with us into that future. The story in Mark's Gospel of Bartimaeus, the blind man Jesus encountered on the side of the road, is a compelling one for this time in our journey together as a diocese. As Mark tells it, Jesus, his disciples, and many others are traveling to Jerusalem. And just before they encounter Bartimaeus, Jesus has taken the twelve aside to tell them that he will be condemned, put to death, and that he will rise again. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they ask Jesus for a favor. <laughs> and Jesus asked them, what do you want me to do for you? And as you may remember, they ask for positions of privilege, to be granted a seat on the right and his left in his glory, which Jesus reminds them is not for him to grant, and that he has come not to be served but to serve and to give his life for many. So by the time they reach Jericho and find Bartimaeus crying out for pity, Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? His simple request to be able to see again is granted, and not only that, but because of his faith, he is made well, whole again. So as I, as I travel around the diocese, visiting congregations, meeting with leaders, baptizing and confirming and ordaining and eating, always the eating, which I love, <laughs> I, I'm listening. I listen for what you are asking Jesus to do for you. And over and over again, what I hear is a desire for our churches to be made well and whole. I hear the desire to be able to serve our communities in ways that are truly transformative. I hear you asking Jesus to help others to see what you see and to love what you love about your congregations. And I hear you asking Jesus to remove the stumbling blocks that keep you and those you love from flourishing. I hear you. Part of the response to what I hear you asking is found in all of those new initiatives and programs that you've spent the last two days of convention learning and celebrating. And if you're wondering 
well, which one of these programs and initiatives is going to save my church? Let me answer you right now. None of them. Right? None of them. It is our faith in faith in Jesus and his power to transform our hearts and our lives that will save us. So what are we doing all of this for? What we're doing is we're freeing up energy and resources to participate in the mission to which you are being called. We're called to know and learn more deeply what it means to be beacons of Jesus Christ in this day and age. We are called to know and to learn more deeply what it means to offer generous invitations and provide welcome with lavish hospitality. We are called to know and to learn more deeply what it means to work tirelessly for the sake of the vulnerable and to help the world remember those whom we might otherwise forget. And to amplify the voices that the world wants to silence and to bring into the forefront those the world wants to make invisible. And we're called to learn over and over and over again that the ministry we share with Christ is about showing up and connecting with others who share our values and our passion for the flourishing of God's people, no matter what their race, gender, expression, sexuality, class, or physical ability. And by God's grace, We are called to grow as a community of practice in the ways of leading well, of dismantling white supremacy, of being formed more deeply into the mind and likeness of Christ. This is a tall order. There is more than enough to keep already busy people being busy forever with all of that. So, Let me be clear, this is not about being over busy. As your bishop, my staff and diocesan leaders, we all want to build our capacity to offer bold witness and radical welcome in new and creative ways. And so that's why we're restructuring our governance to structure ourselves into neighborhoods. That's why we're building a community of practice through the College for Congregational Development, Pathways to Vitality, Faithful Innovations, Learning Initiative, Evangelism with Integrity, all of that, all of it. And not every congregation needs to participate in everything, but I believe that every one of our congregations has the possibility to be what God dreams for it healthy, vibrant, welcoming, with a bold and effective witness to the way of love. So I want to be clear. I mean it. I truly believe that every one of our congregations has those possibilities. So I'm hopeful. I am hopeful. And those tools and practices are about giving us the tools we need to do that work. I'm hopeful for things like our campus ministries. In the spring, we're going to welcome to our diocese the Reverend Shannon Ferguson Kelly from the Churchwide Office for Young Adult and Campus Ministry. And she's going to be with us in March to help us explore ways to make our presence and our witness on university and college campuses more vibrant. I want to say a word of gratitude for the ministry of Linda Johnson as she retires and looks forward to what we might be doing in Bloomington right here. We have an opportunity as we seek new clergy leadership positions in both IU Canterbury and Trinity Bloomington to do something wonderfully collaborative in our mission. I'm especially hopeful for our smaller membership congregations We won't always be importing experts from the outside to lead us, but when we have our small church summit, which we'll hold next September, what I see is that we have what we need here. I see what is possible for vibrant, growing, sustainable ministry in the congregations that are already here, our smallest congregations. I'm convinced that you all have much to learn from one another, 
and I'm eager to bring the best practices that are already at play in our thriving, smaller churches to the forefront. As an aside, churches that are larger among us actually have a lot to learn from, from some of our smaller congregations. How to be scrappy, how to be innovative, how to be thinking outside the box in different ways. Being a community of practice means that we learn from each other in that way. We've spent the past year reinvigorating the deacon formation program and refining and clarifying our ordination process as we pray for an increase in both deacon and priestly vocations. And though we've had a lot of transition in our transition staff position, let me be clear that it is my desire to have the best, most effective person serving in that role. It is too important. And so, as Ken and Kristen does, leads that work, it is a priority to strengthen our ability to support congregations in transition. So stay tuned for more news on that front in coming weeks. All the while that we're growing in our mission, we have to address a few of the things that will get in our way if we aren't intentional about addressing them. Money and race. You must realize, though, how much you amaze me over and over again with your desire to ask the hard questions and to do the challenging work of addressing matters related to money and race. Because you all know nobody wants to talk about those things, right? Not really. But we have to. We must. Our diocese is incredibly blessed. This is the thing. We are incredibly blessed with resources that allow us to do mission in ways that would not otherwise be possible. When we instituted the Bishop's Appeal this year, it was with a desire to deepen diocesan engagement in funding ministries that we care deeply about. And you've been incredibly generous generous in supporting our partners in ministry in Haiti and Brasilia and Southeast Mexico, your support in completing the Raynick Welcome Center at Raycross and the anonymous gift that I just learned about recently that is launching a special fund for campus ministry. You'll hear more about that soon. People have been, you have been incredibly generous. It's been extraordinary. So our commitment to supporting local ministries around our diocese also continues to be important. So I want you to know that I'm going to ask our executive council to spend the next year, 2020, re-envisioning how we can revitalize and strengthen the Episcopal Fund for Human Needs. We care about those ministries and we have to revitalize it. As our Officer for Resource Development, John Gedrick, leaves our staff, to become priest in charge at St. James Vincennes, know that a small task group is already being formed to help us continue to do this work about growing our generosity. There's also much more that I could say about dio diocesan restructuring of cash aid to our congregations. I know that's been a source of anxiety. I know it's a hard change for us, but I believe that God desires a future for the Episcopal Church in central and southern Indiana, one that is sustainable in every sense of the word. So we're gonna to walk together as we move towards that grant program that will enable any congregation in the diocese to access funds for mission. And we're gonna to learn to be a church that I assure you will be around if we are faithful for the long haul, if we tend to these matters. I believe we're up to the task, and I believe that we'll be stronger for the effort. Now about race. The work of dismantling racism and white supremacy is not a program or an initiative. This work is central to our faithful discipleship. The sin of racism limits it limits our bold witness and radical welcome, and so we must be intentional and relentless, relentless in recognizing the ways in which it shows up in us and in the world as we work to transform the systems that sustain it. Dismantling the structures that support systemic racism means developing a new identity for ourselves 
and identity as people committed to understanding that all of our systems, institutions, and outcomes, even our church and its life in Christ, we must not be captive to systemic racism and the ways in which it divides us from one another. We cannot let, it, let that win. We cannot let it stop us from being the church. So let us continue to support and coach one another in growing braver as we confront systemic racism. I want to give a shout out to Good Samaritan Brownsburg and their work in this effort and inviting all the rest of us to join their, pil their civil rights pilgrimage from Memphis to Birmingham next year. We will continue to learn together how to make a witness that truly, truly expands our embrace of neighbor. And we will be changed as we do this. Changed and transformed, God willing, into the church. This is a lot, I know. Jesus, though, is inviting us to be well, to be whole and transformed, and he, and he would have known well the words of the prophet Zechariah that we heard earlier today. Let me remind you of those words. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts, for there shall be a sowing of peace. The vine shall yield its fruit, the ground shall give its produce, and the skies shall give their due. And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. The work that we are doing to participate in God's mission is opening up new possibilities for us. For us, for the people we serve in our communities, for all the people of God in our region, and as we go out as beacons, it just spreads. This is who we are called to be. Back in January, at a service at Christ Church Cathedral, Indianapolis, after hearing Dr. Catherine Meeks preach, Dr. Meeks, who's the director of the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Justice, who inspired the theme of this convention, I said to a friend of mine, my dear friend, Canon Carrie Schofield Broadbent, we were sort of talking about things in the pew, and she whispered something to me that I continued to mull over to this day. She asked, wouldn't it be something if 20 or 30 years from now, we look back on this moment as the, as the beginning of the glory days? Can you imagine looking back onto this moment as the beginning of the glory days? Now, we don't know how long Bartimaeus was waiting by the side of the road waiting for Jesus to come by and ask him what he wanted. But as we prepare to leave this convention, know that Jesus has come near. This is our moment. It is a Kairos moment. Beloved, let us not fear the future. As we go forth from this place, at least half a shade braver May our faith indeed make us well. Amen.